Well, I want to come to you this morning with kind of a, a bit of a confession. Uh, I feel like this is a 12-step kind of program that I'm about to begin here, and I'm, i got to say, my name's Jonathan, and I have a problem. Um, I, I, I have, look, you're laughing like you, yeah, we already know, we know, right? Which one's he going to say? We already know. Um, I, I, my, my problem is that I have a hard time asking for help. Anybody, anybody else like me, you don't, you don't want to ask for help, and, and all the wives are like elbowing their husbands, like, you know that's you, you know. Uh, guys, I think, are especially are like that. We don't want to ask for help. I don't want to let somebody know that I have a problem. If I, if I don't know something, my, my go-to now has become YouTube. I found out that I can figure out most anything uh, by watching YouTube. I, if I don't need to fix something on my car that I don't know about how to fix, or if I need to find something out, uh, then I just go to YouTube and I watch the video and, it's, and it solves my problems. Why is it that we have such a hard time asking for help, especially it seems like guys? I, I think probably one of the reasons is could be our, our fear. We have a, a fear of rejection. Maybe, maybe somebody's going to say no, like we don't want to help you, or that's, that's it. We, we can't do that. Um, or maybe, maybe we're afraid of, of somebody finding out that we're incapable, that we can't, we can't really do that. We were hoping that nobody would know that I could do it on my own and no, nobody would really know and we wouldn't be able to, nobody would find out that I'm, I'm incapable of doing something. Uh, maybe for some of us, and, and I think this is probably a big one, there's a, there's a fear that somebody is going to see you as you are. We want people to think that we're, we're good at stuff and that we can handle stuff. At least I think that's probably the case with me. That I don't want people to know that, that I have an issue sometimes taking care of this or taking care of that. I would rather let people just kind of think that I'm perfect. Uh, a lot of laughter, that's right. And I think probably a lot of us are like that. I think social media plays a big role in that. I heard a, a lady talking one time about, about looking at, at, at uh, Instagram. I don't know how many if you guys have Instagram or know what I'm talking about. And if you at least shake your head. So I, you, I at least think you know what I'm talking about, right? All right, some head shaking going on. That's right. Instagram is basically a social media page where, where you post pictures. And people can look at, at, at your pictures. And what happens, at least in this lady's case, she was explaining that she was looking at her friend's pictures on Instagram and her friend had these two cute little kids and they had gone on a picnic you know and they had the the, the white and red checkerboard uh, tablecloth that they used and they laid it out and they had the basket and their her little boy and her little girl wearing these clothes that match and they're I mean the sun's beaming in the background and they're smiling and it's like they've got this perfect life and she looks up from her phone from her friend's Instagram account over at her daughter who's running around and has taken her diaper off and swinging it around like that. <laughs> I mean, we look at people on social media and we think, man, their life is perfect. And I don't want anybody to know that my life is nothing like that. So I, wanna, I don't want to ask for help. I don't want people to think that I'm not perfect. And so and on the flip side of that, we kind of go to Instagram or social media, Facebook or whatever. And we kind of show everybody our best side, too, so that everybody thinks we're good. And so in all of these kind of ways, I think we have a hard time asking for help. And I think Christians, we do this as well. If you're not a Christian here this morning, first of all, I want to say I'm glad you're here. You kind of get a little insight maybe on us. Christians, those of us who are, are, are like this, I think, we, we do this with God. And that we don't really want to ask God for help sometimes. And we kind of, as a last ditch, last ditch effort, maybe we'll go to God and we'll say, God, I need help with this after I've looked at YouTube and, and maybe done some other things. And finally we go and we say, God, I need help with this. Well, today we're going to be continuing our series called The Forgotten. And for those of you who haven't been around or maybe missed a few weeks, The Forgotten is, is actually a 12-part series where we're going through the minor prophets. We're on part seven this week, if I'm counting right, I think that's right. Uh, and, and this week is actually called Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk. I ask around a few different people pronounce Habakkuk's name differently than I do. It's, uh, um, I was thinking, some, I can't even remember now, I've, I've asked so many, but anyway, I say Habakkuk, it's the, it's the prophet Habakkuk, and, and he, was, he was prophesying, but what is so important, I think, about Habakkuk as he goes through this prophecy and he goes about talking to God, is that Habakkuk wasn't afraid to ask questions of God. He wasn't afraid to ask for help. In fact, Habakkuk, as we begin the book of Habakkuk, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Habakkuk, if you'll go to, to if you're not sure where that is, Go to the book of Matthew, which is the beginning of the New Testament, and back up just a few pages, you'll come to Habakkuk. Habakkuk begins, the book begins by the prophet Habakkuk asking two very important questions. Two important questions start off the book of Habakkuk. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab one of those in the pew in front of you. In fact, Habakkuk's going to be on page 785. 
785 in the, in the Pew Bibles. I want to begin by reading for you Habakkuk chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 3. The or oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, this is basically the vision or the oracle that Habakkuk saw, verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So in those, those very short three little verses there, Habakkuk brings about what I think are two incredibly important questions. And the first important question is, how long? How long, God? That's what he says in verse 2. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? How long before you'll hear me? How long, God, before you answer me? How long will you sit back and look at all of this wickedness and, and violence and strife and all of these bad things that are going on in the world? This is what Habakkuk the prophet is saying to God. How long before you see all of this and you start to do something about it? How long will you let this go on before you save us? Have you ever asked how long? I know if you've been in a, in a car in a, going with somewhere with kids, you've heard that, right? That question. How much longer? We just got out of the driveway. It's going to be a couple more hours. You know, relax. This is what kids do, right? I remember when I was a, young, a kid, my brother is three years younger than me. Every year he loves Christmas. And I, as far as I know, he still loves Christmas. But as a kid, he loved Christmas and he couldn't wait for Christmas. So every year about this time, you know, around the first of uh, November or after uh, Halloween, he would make these chains. They would get construction paper, he would cut them into little slivers, and he would staple or glue the, the pages, the, the little sheets together until he made this chain for however many days was left between now and Christmas. He'd go to the calendar, he'd count because he wanted to know how long before Christmas. And he had his visual. So each day he would take off a chain link until the, you know, the two days before Christmas, he had two, the day of Christmas. He, it was Christmas time, so his chain was gone. <clears throat> he wanted to know how long. Well, when I was growing up, I remember my biggest how long was how much longer till I get my driver's license. I could not wait to get my driver's license. I could be free. I could do my own thing. No more rules, you know. That's what I thought anyway. It didn't turn out that way. In fact, the rules kind of seemed to tighten around me. But, but I wanted to know how long till I get my driver's license. And then after that, how long until I graduate? How long before I can move out? How long till I get married? When we had kids that were little, I remember, how much longer are we going to be buying diapers? And for those of you who have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Please, Lord, let us end this. How much longer till we're out of diapers? And some of you may ask God bigger how long questions. How much longer until this sickness is gone? How much longer will I deal with this? Or how much longer will my loved ones have to deal with this? How much longer until we're out of this financial crisis, God? How much longer? How much longer till I, till I find a spouse or till I, till I get a friend? Or how much longer till you end these things that are going on? Lately, I've been asking the question, how much longer do I have to watch these political ads? I'm about to die, God. Amen. Yeah, can I get an amen, right? Yeah. And most of us, and though we may say how much longer, God, most of us actually don't ask God how long enough. I mean, we like to worry about these things ourselves. We like to try to handle them on ourselves. I know that's true for me. Well, Habakkuk was living in a, in a nation that was far from God. Does that sound familiar? Now, I think as we read through these and as I've gone through these minor prophets, as we've gone through them each week, it's become so apparent to me that, that, that it's so applicable to our lives each time we look at one of these prophets. Habakkuk was living in a nation that was far from God. Not only was Judah, where he was in the southern kingdom, far from God, but Babylon, who had come in and kind of taken over, they were far from God as well. They were oppressing uh, those that, that were in Judah and they were far from God as well. And so in light, as, as Habakkuk looked out, a, a prophet of God, as he looked out on the world around him and he saw injustice and oppression and brokenness and corruption, Habakkuk sees all of this and he cries out to God, how long? And for me, as I, I read that and I think about that, it brings to mind one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. As I was working on that on this week, this week as I was thinking about that question, how long? It brought to mind for me Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. 
And these are the words of the, the, those who have been slain for their witness to God. They cried out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? If you read Revelation 6, you can, you can see the, the souls of those who have been, been killed because of witness, their witness for God. They're, they're just longing for God to do something about it, to make this injustice right, and they cry out, how long? And that same question that they ask is the question that Habakkuk asked in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. But he also asked a second important question. The second important question is, Why? Why? It's what he said in verse 3. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? He's saying, God, God, you see what's going on. Why are you not doing anything about it? Why is this happening? What's going on? That, that question is so short, right? Just three little letters for, for why. And most of the time when people ask the question, they're, they're looking for not a, a short response. It's a short question, but they don't want a short response. That little question begs for something deep and weighty in response. One of the, one of the most popular answers for why is because. That's what I tell my kids, right? Why, Dad? Well, because. Just be quiet. When, I, when my kids were little, that, that, um, that worked okay. Um, eventually, as they got older, it didn't work quite as well because why is a bigger question, right? I remember when my, when my kids were really little, I, I used to like making up stories um, if, just for fun. We, we, um, they would ask me questions like why, and I would go into this tangent like this crazy thing. One time we were going to a, a baseball tournament. Chase played baseball, my oldest to played baseball a lot, and, and we were traveling from one town to another to go to a baseball tournament. He was probably seven or eight years old, and, and there was another kid that was on the team um, in our car traveling with us, not part of our family, just was traveling with us, and something came up as like a why question, and I, I began telling the story of, of a time that I went to the beach, and I was out in the water, and I got attacked by a shark, and I had to fight it off, and it was amazing that I lived, and, and all of this story, and this kid's eyes were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and he looks at Chase, and, and is like are, kind of this, are you serious face? And Chase just went, no, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> so my kids, they understood me, but this other kid didn't. Well, sometimes we, we ask these kind of questions. Why? We want some kind of response. We, we want something big. Because pithy answers don't cut it when you ask something profoundly important. In fact, this question, why do bad things happen? Which is what Habakkuk was asking, right? Why, why do bad things happen is one of the most profound theological questions that's ever been asked. Most people, when they're talking about this, they're, they're talking about what's usually referred to as the problem of evil. If God is good, why? I mean, if God is good, then why do we see these things happening? If God is good, then, then why do bad things happen? If God loves us then why and good, then why do bad things happen? Either God doesn't love us, or, or God's not powerful enough, or maybe God's not good. That's kind of the response that you get. If, 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 if there is evil and there is a God, why? And my hope for most of us, and as Christians, most of us are Christians, my hope for most of us as Christians desiring to know God and, and, and to make God known to others, my, my hope is that we would look at the world that we live in and ask the very questions that Habakkuk was asking. Why, God? And how long? When we look at what's happening in the world, we see pain and tragedy and suffering and violence. And, and we ought to cry out to God, why? When we see a huge gap between those who are rich and those who are poor, there's nothing wrong with being rich. Let me say that. There's nothing wrong with that. Some of us in this room are extremely wealthy. But when we see the gap between rich and poor and we see the rich having five or six or seven houses and eight or nine or ten cars and, and, and nothing being done about the poor, we have to ask God, why? It's a hard issue, of course, but... Why? And how long? God, when are we going to take care of this? When is this going to be okay? When are, when are those who have so much going to begin to take care of those who have little? When we look at the world and we see, when we see genocide, and Christians and other religious minorities in the Middle East at the hands of ISIS and others, we ask, why? God, how long will you allow that continue? God, when will you step in and do something? Why is this happening and when is it going to end? 
when we see orphans all over the world, even here in Gwinnett County, with no parents, little hope for anything, little hope for anything at all, much less adoption. For, for some, it's in, in, impossible to, to even adopt. Those who want to adopt can't do it. And we, 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 even though there are people who want to and, and kids who need to be, it's just, it's so difficult. We look at those kind of injustices and we say, God, why? This week, I, I asked a friend of mine who is in the process of an adoption right now, what, what, it co what does it cost for an adoption? I, I know it's expensive. I just didn't know how much. And, and he said that, that domestic adoption costs between ten and $15,000. I mean, that's difficult. I mean, you think about a young family who, who can't have children and desperately wants a child, and you think of the children who need a home like crazy. I mean, that's, that's tough. He said it, it gets worse. If you want to adopt a child from overseas, it can be thirty dollars or $40,000. Uh, my friend Kelly, who, who I talk about sometimes, and you've met, he's preached here before, adopted a little girl from, from India, and such a blessing. But before they went to India to try to adopt, they tried to adopt a, a child from China. And, and to even be considered, to begin to be considered, you had to have $80,000 worth of stuff before they would even look at you as a possibility to adopt. And, 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 orphanage in, and orphanages in China are, have thousands and thousands and thousands of children waiting to be adopted. And you, you look at that, how it can cost between ten dollars and $40,000 to adopt a child, yet it can only be a, a few hundred dollars to have an abortion. And we wonder why. And we see these kind of things and we think, God, why? This kind of injustice. God, how long will you allow these things to continue? When are you going to do something about it? This week I read an article in the New York Times about the arrest of seven men who were accused of, of sex trafficking women. What they did is they, they would go, they were from New York, they would go to Mexico, they would isolate young girls, some of them even preteen girls from their families. They would snatch them and bring them back to New York City and force them into prostitution, keeping the money for themselves. The article ended by saying that between 14,500 and 17,500 girls are trafficked into the U.S. each year for the purpose of sex slavery. And as tragic as that is, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men waiting for those girls so that they could purchase them for themselves. And we see things like that and we think, God, why? Why are you allowing this to happen? God, how long are you going to continue to allow these things to happen? And so that's what Habakkuk asked. These are two very profound questions of God. He's looking at his, where he was, his nation, his people. God, how long and why? And let's look at God's response. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. God says this. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. If God stopped there, Habakkuk's got to be like, okay, good. This is going to be good. I asked God why and I asked God how long. And God says, look, I'm getting ready to do something. Look what he said in verse 6. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians, the people who are... Uh, totally, utterly against God coming in to, to possess Judah. God's saying, look at the Babylonians. Look at the Chaldeans. I'm going to use them. And Habakkuk's got to be like, what? Wait, wait a minute. God, that's, that can't be right. Well, wait a minute, God. Let's take a step back because I ask God, how long are you going to let this happen? The Chaldeans are doing this very thing. The Black Babylonians, they're the ones doing this. God, how long are you going to let this continue? How long? Why is this happening? And how long are you going to let it continue? And God says, I'm going to use them. Have you ever cried out to God and gotten an answer that was totally different than you were thinking you might get? I think if you've cried out to God enough, probably you have. Or, or maybe you've seen God work in a way that you, that you don't agree with. Or that, or that just doesn't seem right at all. You know, we think we know so much. We think we're so smart. We think that, that, that we know how God should respond. Like, like we've got this whole world figured out. If I only... If I were in charge, this is how I would do. I mean, God is going to do what kind of I think because what I think is the right thing, right? So God, here's what I want you to do, X, Y, and Z. God, go. 
If you read the book of Job, you'll see that that's kind of the question that, that arises. And Job's uh, children were killed in a, in a tragic destruction of life. And, and all of these things, all of these bad things happened to Job. And, and, and Job's family's like, Job, that's God's fault. Job, that's God's fault. Question God. Job, you need to question God. You need to tell God this is what he needs to do and that's what he needs to do. And, and so eventually Job does. From, from, he steps back and he says, I, I'm, you know, I'm, at first he says, I'm not going to do that. No, God is God. I'm not going to do that. And eventually he says, God, yeah, you know what? I've been thinking. Why did you do that? Here's how you should have responded. God, this is what you should have done. God, this is how things should have gone. And in Job 38, God begins answering Job. I don't know how many of you have read that. If you haven't, go to Job 38. It's incredible. God says something like, wait a minute. Who are you to talk to me that way? Where were you when I laid the foundation of all creation? I mean, uh, who, who made your mouth that you can even speak? I mean, I, if, I, if that were me, I'd be like, uh, I need to, my wife told me to say so, God. I would just, you know. But I mean, I'm, what, what tremendous response. And, and yet we do that, right? I mean, what, when God answers our prayers in such a way that we think is not right, that's, that's, we don't like that. I mean, how, how have you responded when, when God reacted in a way you didn't like? To question him? God, how could you do that? God, why would you do that? Maybe you got mad at him. God, that's just, this is not right. This is not fair. God, you're, you're not right here. Maybe you pouted. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about Jonah at the end of Jonah. Jonah didn't like the way God treated the people of Nineveh, and so he pouts, cries about it. Well, Habakkuk had a response, and he, he kind of went back to complaining. Look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 12. Habakkuk said this, are, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my, my Holy One? We shall not die. He's saying, look, God, no way. There's no way. That you're God and we're your people. We're not going to die, right? O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. He's like, wait a minute. And you, rock, have established them for reproof. reproof? Verse 13. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? He's saying, wait a minute, God. How can this be so? I mean, God, you're good, right? God, you're good, and you're looking at evil. You can't even look at evil, and yet you're allowing these people to come in and walk all over us. And then if you skip down to chapter 2, verse 1, Habakkuk says this, I will take my stand at my watch post <clears throat> and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Basically what Habakkuk is saying is, look, look at okay, God, here's what I've said. I've, I've asked you those questions, why and how. You responded. I told you that you're wrong. How are you going to respond to me? I'm going to sit here and wait until you give me the answer that I'm looking for. Are you going to respond, God? It's kind of like, I'm going to stand here at my watchtower. Okay, you're on the clock, God. When are you going to respond? And before we read God's response, I want to make a, a quick side note. It's, it would be easy for us to look at Habakkuk and say, who is he to question God? And we'd be right. But one of the things that I want to say that is so amazing about our God is that God is willing to listen. If you question God with a sincere heart, with genuine motives, God is a God who will listen because he loves you. Can you imagine going to um, the Oval Office and standing before the President of the United States and bringing about these questions? Well, you'd be, first of all, you wouldn't even get in there. But secondly, that you'd be kicked out so quick. They don't want to hear that. But God who created the President and the universe is willing to hear us out. What an amazing thing about our God. So let's look at God's response in, in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And the Lord answered me, Habakkuk writes. God said this, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It surely will come. It will not delay. And basically what, what God says to Habakkuk is write this down so people can hear it. And then in verse 3 he says, be patient. 
All of this is going to happen in its appointed time. God is saying, hold on, I've got this. Habakkuk, don't worry about it. I am in control. I've got it. One of the hardest things for me to do is to be patient. Especially when I, when I feel like I'm out of control or when there's something going on that, that I can't you know, get a hold of or make a decision about or kind of wrestle with. I, man, I have a hard time with that. I don't like waiting. I don't like being patient. And that's exactly what God tells Habakkuk here. And for all of us, that's what God tells us as well. King David wrote in Psalm 37, 7, Be still and know before the Lord and wait patiently, he says for him. If I was quoting another verse in my brain there, let me go back up. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil desires. David said what God said here. Is be patient. Wait on God. And, and God is saying to Habakkuk here and he's saying to us as well, I've got this. I can handle it. When we look out at our world and we see injustice and violence and, and oppression and we see brokenness and broken lives and, and, and people who, are, who we think should not be gaining because they're gaining by evil means and, and they're gaining, God would say to us, I've got this. Don't worry about it. And, and we have to remember, as God says here, that, that if it seems slow, wait for it, it'll surely come. God's timing is always perfect. God is never early. God is never late. His timing is always perfect. So how do we respond? I mean, what, is this, what does this mean for us? What does this look like for us in our lives? I mean, Habakkuk had his time and place and, and his, the world around him was evil. But, but, but what does it look like for us when we ask God why and we ask God how long and we pray these prayers and we ask God to do something about it when the world is falling apart and God seems so distant and seems like he's not answering our prayers, or at least not answering the way we want. How do we respond? Well, I think God gives us a clue here in chapter 2, verse 4, when he says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. What he's talking about here when he says his soul is puffed up, he's talking about those who do evil and he's contrasting them with those who are righteous. And he says those who are evil, the Babylonians and even the Judeans who are not following God, they're, they're puffed up. They're living their lives, but the righteous live by faith. And by righteous, he doesn't mean people who are perfect. He doesn't mean people who do things correctly all the time. What he means is those who follow God. Those who follow God live by faith. And if you don't get anything else out of this little book of Habakkuk, then my prayer is that you get this verse. This verse is so important that it's quoted three different times in the New Testament. We, the righteous, live by faith. Now, one of the things we have to remember as we look at that, okay, how do we respond? The righteous live by faith. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, we have to know what faith is. We have to know what it's not. I think sometimes we confuse what faith is with what it's not. So often we think of faith as kind of this, this mindset, right? Or, that the, or this idea that we have, like, like faith is, I believe in my mind that, that God loves me and that he sent Jesus to die for me. And, and we think sometimes that that's, that's faith and, and that's part of our faith, but that's not faith. Faith is a practice by which we live our lives. Faith is an action word. Faith is not something we, we, we possess or something we, we take with us. Like something we get up in the morning, you know, we, we get cleaned up, we put on our, our shirt and, and pants and, and shoes and we're grabbing our wallet and we put it in our pocket and our, our ladies or purse or whatever and, and you know, we, we oh, don't forget your keys and as you're walking out the door, ah, forgot my faith. Let me get that and take that with me. No, faith is not like that. Faith is an action word. Faith is, faith is a, a, a system of understanding who God is by which we live our lives. That's why James, he talks about this idea of faith being things that we do. Faith being played out in the way we live our lives. That's what faith is. One of the places, I think, in the New Testament uh, that quotes this verse that kind of helps us understand that, that idea that, that faith is, is, a, is a thing we do, um, Again, if, if, if it's going to sound bad. Um, we, are, we are saved by grace through faith, right? I mean, we, we don't earn our salvation by things we do. Um, but our salvation, our faith 
is, it, it leads us to living these things out. And it is kind of go together. It's like hand in glove. You can't have one without the other. That's why, that's why people get stuck on this sometimes. We, we can't uh, do enough things to be saved. But when we are saved by the grace of God, then these things that we do are part of our faith and how we live out. Our lives. And I think Hebrews is one of the places where this, this is quoted. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36 explains it, I, li- I think, a little bit. Hebrews 10, starting at verse 36, says this, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have the will of God, you may see, receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him, but are not of, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And basically what that Hebrews verse is saying is like, look, faith causes us to stand strong. Faith causes us to stand up and to be strong, to not shrink back, knowing that God is there and he's with us. This kind of faith is a living faith. Something that we have, and put, not only as a possession, but something that we live, a, live by, causes us to live in a, different, in a different way. And to help us understand that, one of the things that, that, that causes us uh, some confusion sometimes is the way uh, Bible chapters are divided. So Hebrews chapter 10 kind of ends there. And so most people, when they read, they'll read a chapter at a time. It'll kind of end there. But Hebrews chapter 11 continues this thought. Hebrews chapter 11 is one of the, the most famous chapters in all the scriptures. It's called, generally referred to as the Faith Hall of Fame. And, and so in, in Hebrews 11, you find out about guys like Abraham and about Moses and about people who lived their life by faith. And by their life, you could look at them and it was obvious that they had great faith. And so all throughout Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews begins to describe for us what faith looks like. He would say it looks like Abraham who left everything he had to follow God. It looks like Moses who who did all of these amazing things because God said so. He had faith and it caused him to act a certain way. And even so, it doesn't mean that, that living a life of faith ends all of our difficulty. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, the end of that, verse 36 through 38, we read this. Others, talking about those who have faith, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. That kind of faith. That kind of faith in action, the, the, the kind of faith that, that leads us to do something and live a certain way. That's the kind of faith that God was talking about when he said these things to Habakkuk. The, the righteous shall live by faith. And, and, and so I, I'm, I am so blown away as I read this Hebrews passage this week. And he talks about all of these people who were imprisoned and killed and, and with, you know, sawn in two, which is just so horrific, killed with a sword, going about in, in skins of sheep and goats, destitute. And then he says, and the world was not worthy of them. And that's what God is calling us to. That kind of faith where we live out, not to be like the world, but to live out our faith in such a way that sometimes it causes us to be totally and utterly different and distinct from the world. And God would say, of people like that, the world is not worthy. And so Habakkuk starts off with these, these two great questions, why and how. But J. Vernon McGee, many of you have heard that name. J. Vernon McGee says that even though Habakkuk starts off with these two great questions, the book finishes with a wonderful exclamation point. Look at Hebrews, if you would, or Habakkuk, I'm sorry. Chapter 3, Habakkuk chapter 3, starting at verse 17, and we're going to read the end of the book there. These are the words of Habakkuk after God had answered him in all his questions. Habakkuk says this, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. And then he goes on to the choir master with stringed instruments. He's he's saying that no matter what happens, 
No matter what happens, if the Chaldeans, the Babylonians come in and wipe us all out, I will still sing praises to God. And we could say, God, no matter what happens, if, if, if the violence doesn't end, I will still sing praises to you. God, no matter what happens, if, if people go hungry and children are not adopted, I will still sing praises to you. If, if the, the candidate that I love doesn't win, then I will still sing praises to you because you are God. Amen. And God says the righteous live by faith. And we can live lives of faith because of him who is faithful. We can live lives of faith because God is faithful to us. Because God loves us and sent Jesus to die for us. And because His blood and resurrection have destroyed death and have cleansed us, those who follow Jesus have cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Because of that, we can come and live our lives as righteous people of faith. And because we live and walk and move and breathe a life of faith, then we can know in our hearts and we can share with the world around us that God has saved us through Jesus Christ. So in a moment, I'm going to, uh, the praise team is going to come up. I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to sing a song. And, and, and my, my hope is that you'll just take that to heart, that you'll say, God, what does that mean for me if you're already a follower of Jesus? God, what does it look like for me? What does it mean for me to live a life of faith. What does it mean for me to take those thoughts and understanding and ideas that I have in my head into actual living out and how I live my life? If you're not a Christian today, if you've never given your life to following Jesus, if you've never humbled yourself and taken those first steps, then, then I'm going to be waiting. And if you want to during the song, you can come forward and let me know that. I'll tell you what that means and what that looks like. If you don't like doing that, I understand. Then come see me after the service. The, the invitation is always open. But during this time, I pray that as we sing and and you hear these words, and as we sing these words, that you will, in your heart and in your mind, ask God, what does He want you to hear and learn from what we talked about here in the back? So let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for Your goodness. I'm so thankful for Your willingness to listen to us. I'm so thankful for Your patience in us. Lord, I pray that, that we would have that same type of patience, knowing that You're God knowing that you are on the throne, that you have all of this under control, that, that, that while it looks like things are spinning out of control from our perspective, God, you, you've got this. Father, I pray that you would uh, help each and every one of us to be people who live by faith. Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, I pray that today would be the day they turn their lives to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.